Welcome to the Coach Dave Love Podcast with NBA shooting coach Dave Love and your host, Matt Robertson, exploring the cutting edge of evidence-based shooting development in basketball today, from shooting form to skill acquisition to shot metrics. This is the Coach Dave Love Podcast. Welcome to the Coach Dave Love Podcast. I am your host, Matt Robertson, and with me, as always, NBA shooting coach Dave Love. Dave, tell me what's going on professionally in your life right now. Well, Matthew, I uh, I can't go into a lot of detail, but I've signed on with another NBA team. Let's go. And, uh, and I'm very excited. I've, I've been there a couple of times now. I'm uh, uh, just like the people are, are wonderful. The organization has been wonderful. I uh, love my role, uh, given that I'm hired just af- like after the season has started. My role is more around coaching coaches uh, at this point, and then we'll be we'll be hopefully moving uh, into players as we as we get into the off season. But uh, I don't want to go into a bunch of detail. I want to respect the uh, the team's privacy. But uh, but it's yeah, a- an exciting time. So how are things with you? What's going on with you? Oh, buddy, uh, didn't have returning to play semi-pro basketball in my 2024 bingo card, but I uh, signed my contract and we had, they, it was announced on the weekend and the Tri-City Tide have a 36-year-old uh, shooting guard who, you know, <laughs> 6'6 shooting guard who may or may not be able to move defensively, but we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Tri- Tri-City Tide, that's the name of the team? Yeah, so there's three sort of elements that make up the Moncton area. There's Riverview, Moncton, Dieppe. Uh, so it is the Tri City area. Although the the population of this area is about you know 190 thousand. So <laughs> take for that what you will uh, for the rest of the country and the rest of the continent. That that's awesome. Congratulations. And uh, yeah, I, I've got a well. We, we were talking. Uh, within the last couple of weeks that there's a chance when I'm out there for clinics that there, that may coincide with the beginning ish of the season. Like is I think it was mid March. I'm planning to be out that way. So we'll be starting in mid February with training camp and the regular season starts beginning of March and goes till May. So it's a short and quick little season, but buddy, you might catch a little bit of the action. Uh, you'll see me hanging out in the corner for a, about 10 minutes, give or take, is sort of how I see this going down for myself. <laughs> what what other, uh, and this this is going to become very niche uh, geographically, uh, mm. but we'll move on pretty quickly. Uh, what what other cities slash towns will, <laughs> will be in the league? Uh, so St. John, New Brunswick has a team. Uh, they have a slightly smaller population. Uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, I believe, is going to have a team. They are a larger population. And then potentially Bathurst, New Brunswick, which is North North. Um, There is a Netflix documentary about them. They had an incident a bunch of years ago where there was a a bus accident in a high school team. And the next year that team won the championship and it's a wild kind of story. Um, So that's would be the four teams. And then Maine will also like Rhode Island, Maine will have a division within our conference as well. So I don't know what the crossover will be like. You might play them once, uh, you know, one road trip per season or whatever, but that's kind of going to be the space of the schedule. And the TBO has a few other regions like that. So I think at the end of the season, there's some kind of regional crossover for the best teams in the region. But uh, I've, I've got my fingers crossed for a home and home mm. uh, with uh, uh, with whatever the, the Halifax Windjammers. Oh, no. that was the Windjammers was a team in the 90s. Yeah. Um, then it, it was played against the Calgary 88s. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it was the Rainmen next, uh, Halifax Rainmen, then the Halifax Hurricanes. I don't know what this iteration of the team is going to be called. The Windjammers, I'm putting it out there. Oh, it is such a great name, eh? The literal dozens of uh, uh, Coach Dave Love podcast followers. We need to, we need to, um, form a petition that will probably fit on a post-it note uh, <laughs> to get the Halifax Windjammers just because it's nostalgic to Dave Love. And that's about the only reason. Uh, Matt, do you have argument. a tale? You've, uh, you've done a tale? You have to explain what's going on here because all of a sudden my, that disappeared. 
I have uh, one real child in the house and two that contain a lot of fur and have tails. And one of them is an attention and doesn't come in this room at all unless we're doing the podcast. So this is uh, it's a little Blake, Blake Griffin right here uh, just posting up on my lap. We could ignore him. Uh, pretty all right. All right. <laughs> Maddie, should we get into it? Should we get into the meat of the episode? Let's go. So actually, this is more precursor than we usually get. So thanks for that. Um, okay. So in the last four weeks, we've talked about two of your published studies. And we're talking about a third one today that is in the process of being peer reviewed. So this is kind of a fun one for me to, again, to see the academic side. But I think this one is very practical from a, a, a theory standpoint for a lot of coaches. Do you think that's fair? Uh, yes. And, and it's something that, that I, I think right now in the basketball culture, we do terribly only because we're kind of unaware of the idea. And, and as we, as I hope we go through this episode, it will inspire some thought from basketball coaches and we can just be a little bit more, uh, purposeful in our practice planning. And you're talking about that from a macro standpoint, not practice planning like today, but practice planning this week, this month. Well, it kind of both like there's going to be. Uh, so the idea that we're talking about is going to is periodization of shooting development. And, uh, and so I'll give you a little background on my introduction to, well, here, I'll give you a definition first of all of what, <laughs> what periodization is. So periodization is this idea that different players should be practicing in different ways at different times. Uh, and that each day affords a coach a chance to practice in a certain way that might be beneficial depending on when the next game is. But as coaches, most of the time we miss this opportunity uh, and practice the same way on a daily basis. So let me give you like a, a, an example of how we we are very aware of periodization in other elements of our lives, uh, but maybe haven't thought about it from a shooting perspective uh, yet. So marathon runners, if you're training for a marathon, you do not go out and run a marathon every day of training. Um, you don't do the same kind of training every single day. You will do long, slow distances. You'll do tempo runs. You'll do interval work. You'll be do speed work. You'll do hill work. And each, each type of practice has a different benefit and different rules that would, uh, that a coach needs to be aware of in order to make it and make it effective. For example, very obviously, you don't want to go out and do a tempo run and run slowly. You're missing the point of the tempo run. And yet we kind of do, we, we don't think of shooting this way. We do the same kind of shooting practice almost every single day. And then often it misses the potential benefits um, in in various ways that we've discussed throughout different episodes of the uh, the podcast. So that's like a, a general overview of what we're going to be talking about. Like, how do you train for a marathon basketball shooting version? Like from a global basketball standpoint, this is something that we don't do a bad job of, I think, um, from a week to week basis. You know, if you if you think about so our college season, for example, we usually play Friday, Saturday or Saturday, Sunday. So we usually have day off Monday, kind of light Tuesday, a lot of shots. Wednesday, we go over the sets from the other team and we play a little five on five. And then Thursday, we play a little five on five. And then Friday is light and we go through our sets like there's there is sort of a flow to the way we do this from a global perspective. but game shooting is never taken into account ever. That's just right. like, well, we do these three shooting drills every day and that's the drills we're going to do today because it's one right. of the days that ends in day. So we're going to do those three shooting drills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You're exactly on the, uh, the money. The other example I'll give and you've kind of um, led into it is just the, like if we were going in the weight room, we would have, uh, we would have heavier days. We would have leg days. We would have push pull, uh, or push days and pull days. Um, 
rest days. You mentioned Mondays being a, a rest day for your your program. Like um, that that is all factored in to maximize that training. And yet, uh, and yet we never, we never do that from a shooting perspective. So my introduction to this whole idea, um, came about, uh, let's see, we're in 2024. It was during COVID lockdown. So let's say three and a half years ago. Um, and I read a piece of research by Fabian Ott on periodization of skill training, uh, from the perspective of a football slash soccer goalkeeper. He is the, he's now the goalkeeper coach for Liverpool football club and, uh, and had published this research on, on how you can periodize your skill training for goalkeepers. But with uh, the overall idea being applicable to any other sport, any other skill. And, uh, and so I read that research and thought, I think this is really important. And unfortunately, I just didn't have the skills uh, from a a understanding skill acquisition standpoint to to fully get it, uh, to fully understand the, the nuances of what he was talking about. And then I guess about a year ago, can it be that long? Maybe it's more like eight months, six months or so ago. I, I discovered the research again, and having had more exposure to more skill acquisition ideas, I now ninety percent understood the the messaging, and still and thought even more so. This is important. Like this is really really valuable, and realize I do some aspects of this. Uh, and there are definite areas that um, uh, that I can improve upon based on on this research. And then looking at how I've seen NBA teams practice, thinking teams do not do this at all. Um, essentially, what it comes down to is there there's three different phases in how in skill training. Uh, that are scheduled depending on when your next performances, your next games will be. And often basketball only trains partially in two phases and often misses the point in both of them. Hmm. So we could, in other words, we could look and say like, oh, we're doing, we do performance training. Yeah. And then as we start to explain what performance training really is, you might go, uh, well, we don't really do that part of it. And so half measures get you nothing. Um, and then oh, f- f- um, movement coordination. Yeah, we do that. We do form shooting. And yeah, but do you, have you, have you done this when you lower or when you, when you do your movement coordination? Oh no, we, we don't. And so again, half measures got you nothing. Um, that's about where basketball training Uh, is. And the beautiful thing about this is I don't think it's difficult to Mm. take significant steps forward. That's a really good tease, Dave. Let's take a quick break and we'll dive into that when we come back. Hey there, basketball fans. I'm NBA shooting coach Dave Love and I've got exciting news just for you. Introducing my exclusive free basketball shooting newsletter. It's packed with insights and techniques straight from the hardwood. Have you ever wondered how NBA players improve their shots? Or how you could get to the next level, whether you're a college player, a coach, or a budding youth player? My newsletter brings all this and more directly to your inbox. Each edition is a deep dive into the world of basketball shooting. I'll share some of the tips and ideas that I use with my NBA clients tailored for every level of the game. But wait, there's more. Subscribers receive exclusive monthly discounts on my online products. From training videos to personalized coaching sessions, you'll get it all for a fraction of the price. And the best part of all, it's absolutely free to join. So what are you waiting for? Elevate your game and join a community of passionate players and coaches from around the globe. Signing up is easy. Just visit CoachDaveLove.com. 
All right, welcome back. If you're first time listener to the podcast, we have a gimmick or a shtick. I can't remember what we settled on. Uh, where after a shtick. timeout, it's just shtick. it's a shtick. Yeah, gimmicks imply that it's is 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 buffoonery. This is meaningful. This is this is a shtick. This not is a gimmick. We look down our nose at, at gimmicks. <laughs> so we had a timeout, and after timeouts, uh, we come out. And we run an ATO in real basketball games. So Dave's going to drop a play. I'm going to put 24 up on the clock, the thought clock in my office, uh, and Dave's going to give a concise look at an idea we talked about in the last segment. Well, we didn't get too much, but I want to make sure that people do understand what periodization uh, training is. And so periodization for shooting training is essentially the idea that uh, depending on when your next game is, different days of forward coaches, different opportunities to practice different ways with different players. And we often miss those opportunities and practice the same way with with players all every single day, no matter when the game is. Got a really decent look. Good job by you, coach. Couple, Thank you very much. A couple points up on the board for Coach Love. So, okay, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the the three different phases? Do you want to start with basketball in general? Like, how would you like to roll this out, coach? Oh, my goodness. Let's start with talking about what the uh, – let's do an overview of the, the phases, and then we'll get into movement coordination uh, from there. So within the, the periods, periodization plan that, uh, uh, Fabian Ott put out, and we, we're going to have Fabian on the podcast eventually here, once the English premier league season is done. Um, he broke it up into three phases. So we've got movement coordination training, uh, skill adaptability training and performance training. Um, movement coordination, I sometimes refer to because, uh, re refer to as blue days because, uh, within the graphics that Fabian created and then we modified for the basketball version, um, those were, were in blue. And then the skill adaptability are green days and performance training is, is our red days. And, um, the first thing that I would want coaches to understand is grab your schedule and mark down all of your game days. Uh, mark those in red. And then all of your off days, all the days that you don't plan to practice, those are yellow. So we've identified when the games are and when we're not going to be training. And, uh, and so now we're kind of left with... Uh, the days that should be ramping up towards uh, the red performance training, but uh, but each blue and green day have different purposes. So let's go back to let's go start with uh, movement coordination training. What what I want you to imagine and what I want you to picture when I say movement coordination is modern uh, form shooting. The way I describe it in order to over, oversimplify the idea for people that might not understand and they feel like they're drinking through the, uh, the fire hose. Um, think of, of movement coordination as, as form shooting where you're trying to explore around a more optimal movement pattern in an, in an environment where that exploration is very, very possible. So, so we don't want a high level of 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 uh, game representativeness, uh, tax complexity, or variability at this point. So I want to ultra simplify this idea for the coaches out there as the voice of the people. I haven't referenced that yep. in a couple of weeks, so Please. it's important to establish my you know situation here. Um, right. When you say form shooting, you mean shooting slowly, close to the hoop, right? No, <laughs> no, I do not. Thank you very much for for leading me into that. That, uh, what what's really important, and this is the first area that people kind of miss the purpose of of movement coordination training. They think, oh, well, oh, good, I do form shooting, so I'm doing movement coordination training. But it's it's low level of variability. It's low levels of uh, of tax complexity. And it's low to moderate levels of game representativeness, but it's not no level. Um, 
so the the as we've discussed many times the biggest challenge or criticism that i have of of traditional form shooting is it's almost no uh variability like most people do it stand close to the rim with no game representative tuck your hand behind your back be stationary be upright be two feet from the front uh of the rim um and and there's no uh tax complexity at all with within it and while we might need those things to be we are probably do especially with weak shooters need those things to be dramatically reduced that doesn't mean eliminated and so the last the point that i want to make sure that i i emphasize when we talk about this is the only reason that we are lowering these things uh these categories so much is to give the player a chance to be highly accountable to exploring around a new movement pattern this is this is deliberate this is purposeful and it's not just uh chit chat uh about what you had for dinner last night with the player while they shoot slowly with one hand um that it, it movement coordination should be we're exploring around this idea maybe it's get your feet wider but get uh trying to <laughs> maybe it's get better balanced i was going to say get your feet wider apart but but that's not really the purpose the purpose is to get better balance of the solution often not always is get your feet wider apart um so we need to be putting a player in a, a position where they have the chance to be balanced so they can uh, explore what that feels like um and then how to go about coordinating their movement pattern in order to get into those kind of balanced stable positions so that's a lower task complexity while still exploring around a new movement pattern on these um these blue days these first sort of lowest effort or lowest competitive uh version of the of the training day is that correct yeah yeah and so let's let's chat for a second about when are the optimal times to do this this would be early in the off season hmm. um if like for an nba team uh this would be the the time in may june and uh, and maybe into july um and and within a season you can still revisit movement coordination days uh they should just be days that are removed from game day you don't want to necessarily do a movement coordination day immediately before a game unless and this is where coaches need to start to get knowledgeable unless that's the challenge point for a really weak shooter a really weak shooter may need to revisit the movement coordination phase more often you may need to prioritize it at uh, less optimal uh, times for those players but theoretically if in that college or high school season where you're playing two games on a uh on a on the weekend then yeah your first day back at practice the the tuesday I, I would say that would be your your movement coordination day. A weak shooter, they may either do it again on Wednesday or come back to it again on Thursday. Uh, but this this is like the early deliberate phase uh, for players. So movement coordination day for one player may look like skill adaptability training for another player if that player is a really weak shooter ish. Uh, kind of too simple, too simple. Yeah. So, okay, let's, let's move into skill adaptability, skill cool. adaptability training. Uh, coach Ott had broken up into, uh, into three different sub phases. And essentially the three different sub phases were individualized, small group, large group or team. And so we can still work on our skill, but each one of those sub phases 
are now uh, dramatically increasing the game representativeness and the tax complexity that that now when you go from the the uh, initial phase of skill adaptability, the light green um, or greeny blue, if you will, um, that might be the player and a coach. Um, whereas you get into a mid green and you're more into small group, uh, two, two V two, uh, three V three, two V one, um, and and then once you get into uh, the dark green, that is very game representative. That's four on four, five on five. They've got more uh, more skills being incorporated uh, within the uh, the practice. So the tax complexity, the variability, everything just increases. Um, I, I do want to point out so that I don't forget this, and I hopefully I'm going to remember to say this many times. This is a non-linear um, learning environment that it's not stay in movement coordination until and then move on to skill adaptability until and then move on to performance training until and never revisit the previous phase. This is scheduling to say, like, if you don't play for a little while and you're probably going to have a lower level of, of uh, um uh intensity practice do that with a purpose focus on some of the details do movement coordination then ramp up towards the game as you uh as you go through your week but then once the games are done repeat that that process and so you're constantly um revisiting habits and learning to adapt them. And this this skill adaptability training phase that we're talking about right now, what I want coaches to picture is overcoming challenges. So you're no longer trying to do the optimal movement pattern. You're no longer trying to execute this perfectly as though there is such a thing, but you're trying to get as close to that while overcoming the kind of challenges that occur in games. And uh and this is this like I believe that most of the time at most levels of basketball that I've seen the green phase the skill at adaptability training phase gets almost completely missed and at best we do a little bit of it but without uh the purpose or understanding of why we're just accidentally doing part of it kind of well can you make it real for the people can you give them like a rough example of a practical light green mid green deep green what that would look like in a practice i'll give you um i'll give you a little bit uh, i think it's it's such case by case basis for sure. each player and their their particular habits and their particular skill level um, but so let's view it through my lens, the, I'm working with the weak shooters and let's say the, the, the habit that the player is struggling with is their balance. They, they struggle to, to be balanced on a movement coordination on a blue day on the, uh, Tuesday before the Friday, Saturday games or early in the off season, uh, we would be exploring around. Uh, just the player by them, not by themselves, but uh, I'm still there with them, but they don't, they don't necessarily have an opponent and they're just exploring the habits that will help them be balanced. And I find those the two most common to be wide feet and athletic body posture. So I'm going to put them in situations where they can explore around that. And I can still use ideas like differential learning and, and sort of spend a little time exploring around the different parts of the sandbox, but I'm spending a lot of time exploring the middle of the sandbox. Then the next day, uh, we can get into skill adaptability training and and present the player with challenges to overcome and so for balance the one that i love to do is drills involving pushing where the player is 
uh, trying to create separation away from me, I'm also pushing them away from me and they have more momentum, uh, more force to stop. And the solution that will help them uh, stop that momentum, it's the habit that we're trying to build, wider feet, more athletic body posture. But I don't necessarily have to teach, like tell them to do that. I can just create the problem for them and uh, and guide them towards finding the solution in that problem. Uh, again, we've so much of the practice that I watch, we never provide problems. It's either like do this perfectly in the pristine environment or play a game. And we never build, the, we rarely build the bridge in between. And uh, so then... Um, the the next phase would be a small sided game where we identify a situation where the player really has trouble to get their balance and we we just uh remove all of the excess from that that situation and just say okay instead of playing 5 on 5 the whole as chris oliver would talk about in whole 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 part only if you need to um we we remove a little bit we don't go back to uh, to nothing. We just go back as far as we need to to explore around this new idea a lot. So let's remove the weak side and let's just have a two man game. And I want you to be the guy coming off the 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 pin down or the DHO, and I want you going like full speed. Now we've got the game context um, problem that uh, that we've been working to to solve and the variability that comes along with it where i might constrain the defender by saying like you can you only have these two options um and uh but we should be getting a high number of reps of the kind of problems that uh players will will face that they struggle with and uh, and then as we get into the dark fa dark uh, green phases, then we're just increasing the game representativeness of it to say like, okay, similar thing, but now it's in uh, uh, four and four, five and five, and you might not be getting the shot. Like you may be now having to uh, recognize, oh, good defense. Okay, got to drive this guy, kick, got to relocate. Okay, oh, I'm setting the screen, I'm popping. Oh, here's the shot. Hmm. And uh, and so those are that would be what the the skill adaptability phase would look like uh from a semi-practical level i feel no, like i've been talking a while that's great no totally makes it real when i can look at sort of in your mind each of what those looks like and then whether i'm trying to coach <laughs> shooting specifically or sort of my broader team when we look at periodization of training it can be like we are specifically talking about shooting periodization today but you can take these principles and use this on your broader scale uh for all kinds of skill adaptability training and for all kinds of uh, uh skill acquisition training dave let's take another break uh and we'll continue on when we come back hey basketball fans coach dave love here with an exclusive offer just for you my personalized video shot analysis imagine having an nba shooting coach analyze your shooting form just like I do for the pros. That's exactly what you'll get with my video shot analysis. Here's how it works. You send me a video of your shot and I'll break it down frame by frame. I'll pinpoint your strengths and identify the areas of improvement and give you tailored advice to take your shot to the next level. You'll receive a comprehensive analysis designed just for you. Whether you're a beginner or an aspiring pro, my feedback will help you shoot with confidence and precision. It isn't just feedback, it's a game changer. With my video shot analysis, you're not just practicing, you're evolving, and every single shot counts. Ready to transform your game? Visit CoachDaveLove.com slash store to learn more and get started. That's CoachDaveLove.com slash store and look for video shot analysis. Welcome back. Coach Dave, 24 up on the thought clock. This is an after timeout. Please give us a concise look at what we talked about in the last segment. All right. Uh, skill adaptability training is the bridge between uh, quote unquote modern form shooting and uh, preparing for the the game. 
And I think this is the area that a lot of coaches miss uh, or at least miss the finer nuances on that would make that practice more effective. Awesome. Super concise. Got a wide open three. We drilled it, put three up on the board. Great job by you. You, you know how I, I, I feel like I've been more concise in the last like two or three episodes. And uh, and what I'm really focusing on doing is not like adding a third thought or or hopefully a, just finish the one thought. And guess what? That helps me be more concise. Wild. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> I love that you're working on your game, regardless of whether we're doing the podcast, whether you're in the gym, whether you're doing research, it's uh, always working on your game. Um, 20 second oh, timeout, but, yeah. uh, yeah, I appreciate that you say that. And I've actually had like some people that I know in my, in my real life, uh, like comment on that sort of thing. And I think we've been pretty open about like the, the purpose of this podcast was partially for me to get more comfortable talking about these ideas that, uh, that I haven't always like for me to get reps. And, uh, and for you and I to hang out too. And, uh, and then to also hopefully help some people. And, mm. uh, I, I feel like I've gotten a lot more comfortable talking about, uh, these ideas just because of the podcast. So thanks for your help, buddy. Listen, man, we're, we're all in this together. This is like episode 46, 40, somewhere in there, which is wild. Yeah. We're 52 weeks in a year. We started January of last year. So, um, wild stuff. Also, I've learned an absolute ton and didn't know that I'd be using a lot of the information to train myself uh, in the meantime. So that's a weird little thing. Right, that's right. I forgot of about that. Of this, so. yeah. um, uh, okay. So it, on the heels of that, let's talk about performance training as the red days and what that looks like. And then we can get into the benefits uh, of, of periodization just in general. So yeah, fire me up. Okay. So performance training, all of a sudden we're on a game day or if, if in your case, we could argue that maybe performance training we want to uh, uh, incorporate uh, if you're playing Thursdays or if you're playing Saturday, Sunday, maybe we do a little performance training on, on the day before the game. I forget which days I said you were playing. Um, my memory lasts about seven seconds and that was an eight second sentence. So, um, so let's... From an NBA standpoint, we're going to think of it as game days because we just don't have a lot of time to wrap, ramp up. We do performance training on game days. And so this is the one phase where the goal is no longer development. Mm. The goal is performing and being prepared to perform. And, uh, and so... <sighs> Again, before I forget, I want to make sure I make this point. The purpose of practice is development. And so often we end up doing some of the things that I'm going to describe as performance training on practice days, trying to, tr trying to trick ourselves or, or get ourselves to believe that we're doing development work and we're not. Um, okay, so let me get back to performance training for a second. The morning game day shoot around. Uh, this is where like a lot of tactical things are are being discussed. Uh, where uh, even with weak shooters, we're talking about okay, the this particular set play. Uh, you may have this shot coming out of it. Um, the defender, we anticipate they're going to guard this this way. And so look, look for and explore this option. Know that this is a good shot for you, but this isn't. Um, like those sorts of tactical things are being done. And then we're, we're, we're discussing how we're going uh, we're gonna to navigate that, but then also getting some fairly game representative looks out of that. So often we'll, we'll script out, uh, here's, here's the play that, that we're going to run and here's how we anticipate them guarding this. Okay, everybody understand that? Okay, let's go live. And the def defense has a chance to modify and guard it another way, and the, the offensive team has to react and figure out and explore. That would be the morning of the game day shoot around. Now, let's talk about the time immediately leading up to the game. Uh, 
seven o'clock game, guys will start to be on the floor around four o'clock. And this is no longer about uh, tactics or especially development. You're not learning anything new in this time. You're not exploring a new idea. You're just getting a feel for the ball and comfort. And we're, this is the one time. Spots, 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 spots. 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 <laughs> yeah, the, uh, we're, <laughs> this is the one time that this is actually beneficial. I just want you to feel your the only purpose of this practice is for you to leave your window on the floor feeling like you are unbeatable and that you are prepared for this game and confident going into it. Um, and so, unfortunately, what we end up doing, we do a good job of um, uh, of this phase generally, like across the board, I think the NBA does a pretty good job of performance training. Um, unfortunately, I don't know whether it's social media where people get to now see Steph Curry in his time warming up for a game and they think that's him practicing. And, uh, because they don't actually get to see what he does in practice and so they apply performance training across the board. And what do they do? They do spots every single day. And uh, we can do a lot better than that. So, um, yeah, to, just to kind of recap, performance training is highly tactical. It's not about development. And then the time before the game is just confidence-based. Our college team has almost completely eliminated spots this year. We do a lot of, uh, we call it driving kick shooting, which is a much more, it is still rote, it is still scripted. However, it is much closer to game representative than rebound, kick out, rebound, kick out, rebound, kick out. Um, again, go back and listen to episode whatever uh, spots is the 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 least useful drill we use all the time, I think was the title of it. But yeah. I have spent hundreds of hours doing shots, spot shooting in my career. Um, so it was always magical when that offensive rebound came off the rim and the rebounder turned and looked at me and kicked it out. And it felt magical because I'd done that ref a million times. Oh yeah. I've done this before. <laughs> yeah. 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 But that is like once a game, twice a game, max, over the course of a 30 game schedule, I might get to use that skill 60 times in a season just for context. Oh my like, God. You're, you're a Corver then if you're getting at that many, I think like twice. The bulk, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The bulk of players are, they're getting it like 10 times a season. Yeah. Uh, if they're, if they're lucky. So yeah, it, uh, uh, again, it, let me, while I'm thinking of it, just, uh, re, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Reiterate. Re yes, thank you. That's exactly it. Reiterate the fact that this is a non-linear uh, uh, progression. That even not uh, so, even in the off season, where you're not playing any games, for a weak shooter, like if I if I'm with them Monday to Friday, week one, it might look like blue, blue, green, blue, green. Where it's Monday, Tuesday, we're doing movement coordination because they, they need to explore around this new movement pattern that we're learning. Uh, Wednesday of week one, I'm introducing some challenge to it. Okay, now, what do we do when we can't do the perfect thing? How do we, how close can we get? Like, uh, then revisit more optimal on Thursday and challenge ourselves again on Friday. The next week, it might be... Uh, blue, green, blue, green, blue. And then as we go through the weeks, you're just increasing where it's now blue, light green, mid green, light green, mid green, like through those, those five days. And you're just, I want, it's not set in stone. It's just for you to have a guide to understand the purpose behind each form of practice and the optimal time to be doing those. And then as you get more comfortable using the ideas, you'll be able to see like, oh, we need a movement coordination day in here. The, 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 the players just, 
They're moving away from the habits. Let's get back to exploring. And so the coach still has flexibility to do what they need, but we're just, we're absolutely avoiding walking in the gym. Coach looks at player, player looks at coach and they go, what do you want to do today? Uh, I don't know. Let's get spots. Cause I, I've been there. I've done it a million times and there's a better way. Uh, you can go in now and say like, ah, okay. So yesterday we had a, a blue day today. I want to ramp it up. I want to, I want to get, give you a little bit more challenge. And maybe the player says to you, Nope, I, uh, my back is killing me. And, uh, or I'm really struggling with this. I don't feel this. You can adapt the, uh, the framework, but it gives you a starting point. So ostensibly this paper has data that shows this is a better way to learn over a short and longer period than just haphazard or linear sort of development. Is that kind of the idea, the Coles Notes version of this? Yeah, not necessarily data, uh, that it's it, like citing the other research that support uh, nonlinear pedagogy and uh, that support uh, an ecological dynamics approach and uh, supports a player-led approach, which is essentially what, what we're doing. That, um, that as opposed the, the the data that would have been done in those studies and now we're putting this is more of a case study paper gotcha regardless very cool and it does show that we are leaving some juice on the table like we only have so much time for development especially in the college program um, you might have a player that's with you for one or two years four or five years max but that is not a lot of time um, when these are like prime prime development years and we really have to make the most of the time yeah yeah and this is uh there there is some to unpack here this isn't necessarily listen to this podcast and uh and then roll out your periodization plan the following week mm -hmm. uh there's going to be some learning that goes into this it took me two and a half three years to wrap my brain around the the concept and i'm still working on the practicality uh, i think i do the blue and the light green phase really really well um i know the people around me do the mid green and dark green but we're figuring out because i haven't seen a team do anything like this we're figuring out how do we use all of our skill sets now to uh uh to build a more holistic and better shooting plan so don't as a trainer I, I i love you guys do not now take this idea and say okay i i need i'm i'm doing movement coordinate you need i'm doing movement coordination tomorrow and then i've got the player coming back next week and we'll do skill adaptability no you you need you need to do some learning around this idea <laughs> and explore fabian's different research papers um make sure that you have a a a great greater understanding this is simply the introduction to the concepts um that i want people to understand so we have an intro to the concepts do you have a hammer action for today um for the first listener hammer action is where we hammer home an actionable item that is very practical for your average coach whether that's a youth team a college team an mba team um, I know, Dave, this has all been kind of a short, like a, a, a short dive into a large topic. Um, Here, here's my hammer action. I want everybody to go to coachdavelove.com hmm. slash periodization dash of dash shooting dash development, or just go to uh, coachdavelove.com blogs. And uh, and then look for the periodization training. There's graphics in there with with more detailed explanation of what each form of practice looks like, um, and uh, and and start to. That's where I want you to take some actionable steps. Is in the learning uh, of this right now. Don't if, if I'm guessing for ninety nine. 
percent of coaches listening, this is the first time they've kind of heard about this. Uh, that's great. Two years from now, have a plan. Um, I can also, Dave, like the average coach, the the lazy coach inside me is like, that seems like a lot of work, Dave. You know, yeah, so is winning. Um, <laughs> so is winning. Whoa, that is a very good comeback, and I have changed my attitude. <laughs> yeah, um, you go ahead. You go ahead and like the, it is a lot of work. You're right. Th this is. Um, Oh, man, I'm gonna sound like such a jerk, but the I, this is I think is part of the reason why I'm with limited shooting ability myself, with uh, a bald head. <laughs> uh, I don't know how that factors in, uh, but like why I, I'm able to get and coach at the level that I'm at is. I'm not, I've moved out of years ago, the um, opinion-based coaching that is prevalent everywhere. And I work and I'm, I'm trying to share some of the work that I've done to, to guide people on. We think that shooting coaching is what habits and what drills. And I hope as you're listening through these episodes, you're going, oh, it's a lot more than just that. And, uh, and then you've, you're hopefully getting some actionable ideas on more specifically what it could be. One of the benefits of this podcast is it helps people skip the line a little bit yeah. in that you have 20 years of work behind all of your opinions, your strategies, your coaching methodologies, and you're helping us skip the line just a little. That's not, oh, now I have 20 years of knowledge and experience because I listen to 40 podcasts. That's, oh, I'm able to knock off a year or two years off that 20 year process because of all the information that you've been willing to share here, which I think is a really cool thing. Right, and one of the things that uh, I think you and I talked about just in a text, um, one of my worries about the social media mm -hmm. world um, is it's it's almost become a gigantic game of telephone. Do you, I, I we we had this text conversation, didn't we? Do you, did you know what I meant by the game of telephone? Do I need to explain that? The, it's I hear one thing, and it's almost what you meant to say. And when I tell it to somebody, they hear almost what I. And it, by the time it hits the fifth person, it's unrecognizable from the thing that you actually said. Yeah, yeah, that I whisper in the person's ear beside me a, a sentence, and then they whisper the same sentence into the person beside them. It goes around the circle until it comes back, and it's no longer even close to the initial sentence. That every every iteration just gets miss. They miss something, and uh, and the message gets slightly more and more lost. And I, I worry that's kind of the road that we're heading down within social media is that somebody like Fabian Ott comes along and shares some researched idea. Uh, and I'll, I'll throw myself under the bus here. And then I come along uh, three years ago and I go, I think this is important. This is, and if I were to have shared it at that time, mm -hmm based on my limited knowledge, I would have probably got 60% of what he intended and I would have got 40% of it wrong. And then whoever follows me then goes, wow, that's really important. And if they share it right away, we've now got 60% of my 60%, which would now be 30%, no, 40% of the whole. Anyways, I'm not gonna worry about the math. Um, and it just, the message gets lost and I watch versions of this all the time where like I share a drill and then you see somebody else and they're like, you know, they got it from you and you look and you're like, well, okay, good, but not really. You kind of missed the whole point of that. Um, and it's, it's, that's why for me doing research 
Like instead of, um, instead of me sharing, I reached out to Fabian and said, I thank you for sharing that. I think this is really important. I'd love to be involved in the shooting app adaptation about of this so that we can make sure like I can share my opinions, but then we can have other experts to say, no, 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 Dave, you, you just dumbed that down too much mm -hmm. and you missed the, the point. And hopefully we can now make this a basketball version or uh, of the research that Fabian intended not the 60 percent coach dave love you're the man appreciate your time as always uh thank you for sharing all of that um it is our greatest hope here that they get the message for what it is um as as an audience and as a listener we really appreciate you and appreciate your time so uh dave if they have any questions or if they want to reach out where can the people find you uh, Coach Dave Love on in Instagram and Twitter, or even better, go to CoachDaveLove.com, sign up for the newsletter. And uh, I got to get going on. I, I've now got to revamp the emails that go out. Uh, but sign up for the newsletter now. You'll get uh, you'll get the current version, and then once I have the new version ready to go, you'll get that as well. Bunch and of free check information. Out Check out the Shot Metrics book coming soon to an Amazon near you. Yeah, just waiting to hear from Amazon on when that uh, will be ready. I'm guessing sort of within the month or so. Woo, that is exciting. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Matt Robertson. You can find me on LinkedIn or on Twitter slash X at Coach Matty Rob. Uh, thanks for sticking with us to the end. Please rate, review, subscribe, tell a friend. It all really helps. And looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of the Coach Dave Love Podcast. To stay up to date with our future episodes, please remember to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform. Don't forget to sign up for Coach Love's free shooting newsletter on CoachDaveLove.com and be sure to follow him on social media. You can find him at Coach Dave Love.